Section 5 of Mr. Fortune's Practice. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Tommy Hersant, Carlsbad, California. Mr. Fortune's Practice by H. C. Bailey, The Young Doctor, Continued. On the next day but one, Mr. Fortune received a letter. Dear R., the greaser Kemp, who owns the watchman, came in one bright day, cancelled all instructions on the Wilton case, and dictated a new line. No known cause for the rash act. It leaks from his wretched intimates that Kemp has a new pal, one Kuiper, a ruffian said by some to be a Hun, certainly a city mushroom. This seems highly irrelevant. You must not expect Kemp to be rational, even in his vices. Sorry, S.W. Mr. Fortune went into the city and consumed turtle soup and oyster patties with Tommy Owen, the young son of an ancient firm of stockbrokers. When they were back again in the dungeon, which is Tommy's office— "'Oh, Thomas, uh, do you know anything of one Kuiper?' he said. "'Wrong number, old bean.' Tommy Owen shook his round head. "'Not in my department. International finance is Mr. Julius Kuiper's line.' Reggie smiled. "'It is the foible of Tommy Owen to profess ignorance. Big business,' he said. Uh, not so much big business as queer business. Uh, Mr. Julius Kuiper blew into London some months ago. Yes, January. He is said to be negotiating deals in Russian mining properties. Mm, sounds like selling gold bricks. Well, uh, not in my department, said Tommy Owen again. Uh, "'There's uh, some money somewhere. Uh, "'Mr. Kuiper does the thing in style. "'He's thick with some fellows who don't go where money isn't. "'In point of fact, old dear, I've rather wondered about Mr. Kuiper. Uh, "'Do you know anything?' Uh, "'Nothing that fits, Tommy. Uh, "'What does he want in London?' "'Oh, search me.' said Tommy Owen. I say, Fortune, when Russia went pop, some blokes must have laid their hands on a lot of good stuff. I suppose you fellows at Scotland Yard know where it's gone? I wonder if your friend Kuiper's been dealing in jewels. Tommy Owen looked wary. Don't that fit, old bean? "'There's a blighter that's been busy with Brother Kuiper, "'blossomed out with a rare old black pearl in his tie-pin. "'They used to tell me the good black pearls went to Russia.' Uh, "'What is Kuiper, a Hun?' "'I wouldn't bet on it. He might be anything. "'Lean beggar, oldish, trim little beard, very well groomed. "'Talks English well, says he's a Dutchman. "'You could see him yourself. Uh, "'He's had offices in that ghastly new block in Magdalen Lane.' "'Oh, thanks very much, Thomas,' said Mr. Fortune. "'Oh, not a bit. Uh, sorry, I don't know anything about the blighter.' said Tommy Owen, and Mr. Fortune laughed. As a taxi took him home to Wimpole Street, he considered his evidence. The mysterious Kuiper said he was Dutch. The vanished wit also said he was Dutch. Kuiper said he was selling Russian jewels. Wit also dealt in jewels. Mr. Fortune went home and telephoned to Lomas that Julius Kuiper of Magdalen Lane should be watched, and by men of experience. Even over the telephone, the voice of Lomas expressed surprise. Kuiper, it repeated. What is the reference, Fortune? The Wilton case? Quite so. You did say Julius Kuiper? Oh, but he's political. He's a Bolshevik. Reggie also felt some surprise, but he did not show it. Uh, "'Some of your men who've moved in good criminal society,' he said firmly, "'rush it, old thing.' After breakfast on the next day but one, he was going to the telephone to talk to Lomas 
when the thing rang at him. "'Is that Fortune?' said Lomas's voice. "'Speaking, the great Mr. Fortune, I look towards you, Reginald. I likewise bows. Come right on.' Mr. Fortune found Lomas with Superintendent Bell. They lay back in their chairs and looked at him. Lomas started up, came to him, and walked round him, eyeglasses up. "'What is this?' said Mr. Fortune. "'Dum Crambo?' "'Admiration!' Loomis sighed. "'Reverence! Ah! How do you do these things, Fortune? "'You only look human, not to say childlike, "'yet you have us all beat. "'You arrive while we're still looking for the way.' "'I wouldn't have said it was a case for Mr. Fortune either,' said Bell. Uh, "'No flowers by request. Uh, don't be an owl, Lomas. Who is Kuiper?' Lomas sat down again. "'I hoped you were going to tell us that,' he said. "'What in the world made you go for Kuiper?' Uh, "'He calls himself Dutch, and so did Wit. He deals in jewels, and so did Wit. And I fancy he set the daily watchman howling that Wilton must stay in prison. And if you will kindly make sense of that for me, I shall be obliged, said Lomas. It doesn't make sense, I know that. Hang it all. You must do something for yourselves. Justify your existence, Lomas. Who is Kuiper? The political branch have had their eye on him for some time. He's been selling off Russian jewels. They believe he's a Bolshevik. That don't help us, Reggie murmured. No, the connection of Wilton with Bolshevism isn't what you'd call obvious. I did think you were hunting the wild, wild goose, Reginald. All my apologies. None of our men recognized Kuiper. "'but one of them did recognize Mr. Witt. "'Mr. Witt is now something in Kuiper's office. Marvelous, Reginald, how do you do it?' "'My head,' said Reggie Fortune. "'Oh, my head. "'Kuiper's a Bolshevik agent, "'and Kuiper employs a man to put Wilton out of the way. "'It's a bad dream.' "'Yes, it's not plausible.' Not one of your more lucid cases, Fortune. I had thought, said Bell definitely, if Dr. Wilton happened to get to know of some Bolshevik plot, Mr. Fortune, they would be wanting to put him out. Uh, they would, in a novel. Reggie shook his head. But hang it all. Wilton don't know that he ever knew anything. <sighs> "'Perhaps he's a bit of a Bolshevik himself, sir,' said Bell. Lomas laughed. "'And Bell has a turn for melodrama.' "'Yes, yes, there is a lot of melodrama in the world, "'but somehow I don't fancy Kuiper, Wit, and Company play it. "'I think I'll go and have a little talk with the firm.' "'You?' Lomas stared at him. "'Oh, not alone, I reckon, sir.' Bell stood up. "'Well, you come and chaperone me. Yes, I want to look at him, Lomas. Wilton's a medical man, you know. I want to see the patients, too.' Uh, "'You can try it,' said Lomas, dubiously. "'You realize we have nothing definite against Wit, and nothing at all against Kuiper. And I'm not sure that Kuiper hasn't smelt a rat. He's been staying at the Olympian. He was there on Tuesday night.' "'But last night our men lost him.' Oh, "'Come on, Bell," said Mr. Fortune. Outside the big new block on Madeline Street, Superintendent Bell stopped a moment and looked round. A man crossed the road and made a sign as he vanished into a doorway. "'He's in, sir,' Bell said, and they went up to the offices of Mr. Julius Kuyper. A pert young woman received them. They wanted to see Mr. Kuiper by appointment. Oh, Mr. Kuiper never saw anyone except by appointment. He'll see me, said Bell, and gave her a card. Uh, 
She looked him over impudently and vanished. Another young woman peered round the glass screen at them. Uh, sorry, the first young woman came briskly back. Uh, Mr. Kuyper's not in. Uh, better write and ask for an appointment. That won't do. Who is in? said Bell heavily. Don't you bully me, she cried. You don't want to get into trouble, do you? Bell frowned down at her. You go in there and say Superintendent Bell is waiting to see Mr. Wit. Uh, we haven't got any, Mr. Wit. You do as you're told. She went. She was gone a long time. A murmur of voices was audible. She came out again, looking flustered. "'Well, what about it?' said Bell. "'I don't know anything about it,' she said. A door slammed. A bell rang. She made a nervous exclamation and turned to answer it. Bell went first, and Reggie on his heels. In the inner room an oldish man stood smoothing his hair. He was flushed, and at the sight of Bell he cried out, "'But you intrude, sir!' "'Ah, here's our old friend Mr. Witt.' Bell smiled. I should... There is some mistake. You are wrong, sir. What is your name? Mr. Superintendent... My name is Siegel. I dare say it is. Then why did you call yourself wit? I do not know what you mean. I don't forget faces. I should know you anywhere. You're the Mr. Wit who prosecuted Dr. Horace Wilton. Come, come, the game's up now. What do you mean by that, sir? A time to tell the truth, said Reggie sweetly. A time you begin to think of yourself, isn't it? Uh, we know all about the evidence in the Wilton burglary. Why did you do it, Mr. Wit? It wasn't safe, you know. What do you want? Well, uh, where's your friend Mr. Kuyper? Uh, we had better have him in. Uh, Mr. Kuyper has gone out, sir. Reggie laughed. Oh, I don't think so. Uh, you're not doing yourself justice. I don't suppose you wanted to trap Dr. Wilton. You'd better consider your position. Uh, what is Mr. Kuyper's little game with you? Mr. Witt looked nervously around the room. You... "'You mustn't—I mean, we can't talk here,' he said. "'The girls will be listening.' "'Oh, uh, send the girls out to tea,' said Bell. "'Oh, no, I can't do that. "'I had rather come with you, Mr. Superintendent. "'I would rather indeed.' "'Oh, come on, then.' "'Mr. Witt, who was shaking with nervous fear, "'caught up his hat and coat.' The farther door of the room was flung open. Two pistol shots were fired. As Reggie sprang at the door, it was slammed in his face and locked. Mr. Witt went down in a heap. Bell dashed through the outer office into the corridor. Reggie knelt by Mr. Witt. Kuiper! Mr. Witt gasped. Kuiper! I know, I know. We'll get him yet. Uh, where's he gone? His yacht! Mr. Witt gasped. Yacht at Graves End. He had it ready. He groaned and writhed. He was hit in the shoulder and stomach. Reggie did what he could for the man and went to the telephone. He had finished demanding an ambulance when Bell came back, breathless, with policemen in uniform at his heels. The swine, Bell gasped. He's off, sir. Must have gone down the other staircase into Bull Court. We had a man there, but he wouldn't know there was anything up. He'd only follow. Pray God he don't lose them. They lost him last night. I'll send these girls away, said Mr. Fortune. Let the constables keep the door. I want to use the telephone. And, when the ambulance had come and taken Mr. Witt, happily unconscious at last, to hospital, he was still talking into the telephone. "'Is that clear?' he concluded. "'All right. Good-bye.' He hung up the receiver. "'Come on, Bell. It's Gravesend now. This is our busy day.' 
Gravesend, the superintendent stared. But it was into a tea shop that Reggie plunged when they reached the street. He came out with large paper bags, just as a big car turned painfully into Model and Lane. "'Good man,' he smiled upon the chauffeur. "'A Gravesend police station, and a letter out when you can.' With his mouth full, he expounded to Superintendent Bell his theory of the evasion of Mr. Kuyper. As the car drew up in Gravesend, a man in plain clothes came out of the police station. "'Scotland Yard, sir?' Bell pulled out a card. "'Inspector's down on the beach now. I was to take you to him.' By the pier, the inspector was waiting. He hurried up to their car. Oh, "'Got him?' said Bell. "'He's off. Uh, you didn't give us much time, but he's been here. A man answering to your description hired a motor yacht, a cutter with auxiliary engine, uh, six weeks ago. It was rather noticed, being an unusual time of year to start yachting. Uh, he's been down odd times and slept aboard. He seems to have slept aboard last night. I can't find anyone who's seen him here today. Uh, but uh, there's a long Shoreman swears he saw a Tilbury boat go alongside the Cirilla. Uh, that's his yacht, a while since, and the Cirilla's away. Have you got a fast boat ready for us? Uh, at the pier head, sir. Motor launch. Oh, good work, Reggie smiled, and they hurried on board. What's the job, sir? The captain of the launch touched his cap. A dig out after the Cirilla. Uh, you know her, don't you? I do so, but I reckon she ain't in sight. What's the course? Uh, downstream. Uh, she'll be making for the Dutch coast. Are you good for a long run? Uh, surely, and I reckon it will be a long run. She's fast, is Cirilla. Wind her up, Jim. And the launch began to throb through the water. Mr. Fortune retired under the hood and lit his pipe, and Bell followed him. "'He's smart, isn't he, sir, our Mr. Kuyper? His yacht at Gravesend, and he comes down by Tilbury. That's neat work.' "'Oh, don't rub it in, Bell. I know I ought to have thought of Tilbury.' Bell stared at him. "'Good Lord, Mr. Fortune, I'm not blaming you, sir.' "'I am,' said Reggie. "'It's an untidy case, Bell. "'Well, well, I wonder if I've missed anything more.' "'I don't know what you've missed, sir. "'I know I wouldn't like to be on the run if you were after me.' Reggie looked at the large man with a gleam of amusement. "'It would be rather joyful, Bell,' <laughs> he chuckled, and was solemn again. "'No, I am not happy. "'Je n'ai pas de garage. "'I want Mr. Kuyper.' "'It was a grey day. "'The Essex Flats lay dim and sombre. "'The heights on the southern shore were blurred, Yet they could see far out to the Nore. An east wind was whipping the flood tide into tidy waves, through which the launch clove, making, after the manner of her kind, a great show of speed, leaving the tramps that chunked outward bound as though they lay at anchor. "'Do you see her yet?' Reggie asked the captain. "'Maybe that's her.' He pointed to a dim line on the horizon beyond the lightship, a sailless mast, if it was anything. "'Maybe not,' he spat over the side. "'Are you gaining on her? I reckon we're coming up, sir.' "'What's that thing doing?' Reggie pointed to a long, low, black craft near the nore. "'A destroyer, sir. Engines stopped.' "'Run down to her, will you? "'How does one address the Navy, Bell? "'I feel shy. Uh, "'Ask him if he's the duty destroyer of the Nore Command, will you?' "'Good Lord, sir,' said Bell. "'The captain of the launch hailed. 
"'A duty destroyer, sir.' "'Aye, aye, Scotland Yard launch. Come alongside.' "'Thank God for the Navy,' as the soldier said, Mr. Fortune murmured. "'Perhaps it will be warmer on board her.' "'I say, sir, did you order a destroyer out?' "'Oh, I asked Lomas to turn out the Navy. I thought we might want him. "'Superintendent Bell gazed at him. "'And you say you forgot things,' he said. "'Wits shot and all in a minute you have all this in your head. They climbed a most unpleasant ladder. A young lieutenant received them. Uh, you gentlemen got a job of work for us? A, a motor yacht cutter rig named Cirilla uh, left Gravesend an hour or two ago, probably making for the Dutch coast. Uh, there's a man on board that's badly wanted. Oh, can do. Uh, the lieutenant smiled and ran up to the bridge. Uh, "'Starboard five, half ahead both,' he spoke into a voice pipe. Uh, "'You'd better come up here,' he called at them. Uh, "'We'll whack her up as we go.' The destroyer began to quiver gently to the purr of the turbines. Reggie cowered under the wind screen. The speed grew and grew, and the destroyer sat down on her stern, and on either side white waves rushed from the high, sharp bow. Uh, "'Who is your friend on the yacht?' the lieutenant smiled. Uh, "'His last is attempted murder, uh, but that was only this morning.' Uh, "'You fellows don't lose much time,' said the lieutenant with more respect. Uh, "'You seem to want him bad.' "'I could bear to see him,' said Reggie. "'He interests me as a medical man.' "'Medical?' the lieutenant stared at him. Uh, "'Quite a lot of crime is medical,' said Reggie. The lieutenant gave it up and again asked for more speed and began to use his binoculars. Oh, "'There's a cutter rig,' he pointed at something invisible. Uh, "'Not under sail. Laying a course for flushing. Oh, "'That's good enough. What?' The destroyer came up fast. A white hull was revealed to the naked eye. The lieutenant spoke to his signalman, and flags fluttered above the bridge. "'Not answered. Do you think your friend'll put up a scrap?' "'I dare say he will, if his crew will stand for it.' "'Praise God,' said the lieutenant. "'Will they have any arms?' "'A pistol's likely,' said Bell. "'Well, she is Cirilla. He picked up a megaphone and roared through it. The cutter! Cirilla! Stop your engine! There was some movement on the yacht's deck. She did stop her engine, or slow. A shot was heard. She started her engine again, and again stopped. A man ran aft and held up his hand. The destroyer drew a beam, and the lieutenant said what occurred to him of yachts which did not obey Navy signals. There was no answer. A little knot of men on the Cirilla gazed at the destroyer. "'You fellows going aboard her? Got guns? I'll give you an armed boat's crew.' Behind the destroyer's sub-lieutenant, Bell and Reggie came to the yacht's deck. "'Where's the captain? Don't you know enough to read the signals?' Thus the sub-lieutenant began. "'Where's Mr. Kuiper?' said Bell. Uh, "'We didn't understand your signals, sir,' the captain licked his lips. Uh, "'I don't know anything about Mr. Kuiper. Uh, we've got a Mr. Houghton, a Dutch gentleman. Uh, he, he's my owner, as you might say.' "'Where is he?' Uh, "'Down the engine room. Uh, it was him fired at the engineer to make him start her up again. When I had stopped, I laid him out with a spanner.' "'Bring him up,' Bell said. A slim, spruce body was laid on the deck, precisely the Julius Kuiper of Tommy Owen's description. Reggie knelt down beside him. "'He ain't dead, is he?' said the yacht's captain anxiously. But the stertorous breath of Mr. Kuiper could be heard. "'My only aunt,' Reggie muttered. Uh, "'What's the matter, sir?' "'Man hasn't got a heart. 
This is very unusual. Mm -hmm. Good Lord. Heart well over on the right side. Heterotaxy, very marked. Quite unusual. Ah, that's more to the point. He's had an operation on the thyroid gland. Yes, just so. He smiled happily. What was that word you said, sir? A heterotaxy. Hmm. Oh, it only means he's got his things all over on the wrong side. Then I know him, Bella cried. I thought I knew the look of him. As old as he is now, it's Lawton, sir. Lawton of the big bank frauds. He went off with fifty thousand or more before your time, but you must have heard of it. Did a clear getaway. And that's that, said Reggie. Now we know. Some days afterwards, the Honorable Sidney Lomas called on Mr. Fortune, who was at the moment making a modest supper of deviled soul. And then you clear it up, he said. Uh, try that champagne. It's young, but has distinction. Oh, yes, uh, Dr. Wilton quite agrees with me. A faulty thyroid gland is the root of the trouble. I don't want to hear about Mr. Kuyper Lawton's diseases. I, my dear fellow, but that is the whole case. Mr. Kuyper Lawton is undoubtedly a man of great ability. But there was always a cochexia of the thyroid gland. Uh, this caused a certain mental instability, unsound judgment, violence of temper. It's quite common. Oh, is it, thou? said Lomas. But why was he violent to poor Wilton? Well, Lawton got clean away after his bank frauds, as you know. I know all about Lawton. He lived on the plunder in Holland as Adrian Houghton and flourished till the war. Then he lost most of his money back in Germany to win. In the end of 1917, he went off to Russia. This year, he turned up in London as Julius Kuyper, uh, talking about Russian finance and uh, selling Russian jewels. Oh, quite so. Well, in February, he was in a motor accident in Cavendish Square. A lorry hit his car, and he was thrown out and stunned. The unfortunate Wilton was passing and gave him first aid, and discovered that his heart was on the wrong side. Uh, he came to under Wilton's hands. I suppose Wilton showed a little too much interest. Anyhow, Mr. Kuyper saw that the malformation which would identify him with Lawton of the bank frauds was known to the young doctor. Well, he kept his head then. He was very grateful. He asked for Wilton's card, and Wilton never heard any more of him. But Wilton was interested in this striking case of heterotaxy. He noted the number of the car, found the garage from which it was hired, and went round to ask who the man was. They wouldn't tell him, but the chauffeur, I suppose, told Mr. Kuyper the doctor was asking after him. He sent Wit to take a flat over Wilton's and find out what Wilton was up to. I take it Mr. Kuyper was doing mighty good business in London and didn't want to run away. He needn't have bothered. But that's the man all over, brilliantly ingenious and no judgment. Hmm. That thyroid of his. Uh, Wilton had come to know the local detective inspector, that poor chap who committed suicide. I'm mighty sorry for that fellow, Lomas. He was so keen against Wilton because he was afraid of not doing his duty when he liked the man. And then he found he'd blundered into giving false evidence against his friend. 
Ah, uh, I don't wonder he chose to die. Conscience makes fools of us all, said Lomas. Yes, yes, poor beggar. And no wonder Wilton was bitter against him. Well, Kuyper decided that Wilton, with his curiosity and his friend in the police, wasn't safe at large. First, they tried to ship him out of the country, and he wouldn't go. So they put up the burglary. I suppose Wit or Wit's friend, the sham Dutch journalist, is a Hun. That accounts for the Rochtebach and the German keys. Lawton Kuyper has done a lot of business with Germany himself. Yes, he ought to have been on the great general staff. The right type of mind, one of our native Prussians. Hmm. An able man, a very able man, if his thyroid had been healthy. End of section 5